often the people in government, and I was one of those myself, don't possess the requisite knowledge for the lived experiences for the people who are the making decisions for. Mm. So here's an example. I am now in academia and I'm talking to people across the country about electrification and, and how we get people to move to EVs. And somebody heading one of the largest customer EV associations says to me, it's gonna be fabulous. We're all gonna have to plug in either at home or at work to charge and it'll be just a great new world. No blank uh, spots there at are, all. Are you kidding no, me? No blind spots whatsoever. People live in high-rise neighborhoods. Yeah. Where are they plugging in? Hey, folks. Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. And today's episode is brought to you in part by Manscaped. You know what's up with that bush? That bush needs trimming. And if you don't know about it, you better hear about it. Manscaped are the best products for gardening that area. Taking care of that bush is important. And these products are so good, you're going to be showing pride in your new bush-free yard. It's a fact that you will have the best-kept nutsack on the cul-de-sac. And if you don't think that's fucking written in this script, you are wrong. They wrote nutsack on the cul-de-sac because the people at Manscaped are big and bold, just like that bush. Save big and be the most hygienic version of yourself by using our discount code TIRE for 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. Dude, these scripts from Manscaped are hilarious. They love talking about bush and they love talking about leveling up the full body grooming game. They sent us the performance package 4.0. It sounds like it's a, a part of a car. It sounds like you're getting extra horsepower, but it's not. It's the lawnmower 4.0. It's the electric trimmer, and it's a bush's worst nightmare. It's designed to reduce grooming accidents and shave hair on loose skin thanks to a ceramic blade and advanced skin-safe technology. There's not a lot of uh, uh, trimmers out there designed for balls. Correct. I mean, most are designed for faces and adapted to balls. This one other way around. You could use it on your face or your head or other parts of your body, but it's meant for your nuts. Basic landscaping science says when you trim the hedges, the tree stands taller. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious. It also comes with the weed whacker. This fine-tuned nose and ear ear ugh, blah, 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 blah. this fine-tuned nose and ear hair trimmer will make sure your nasty nose pubes are under control. Me being an Arab, the ears. It's the ears. They need work. Dude, my nose Bro. is growing <sighs> after the last five years. I just yeah. hit 35 and it was like, what is all this Bro. stuff? I got bushes now. I used to make fun of my grandpa yep. for them shits coming out of his ears. And now I hit 40. Turns out my boy was just yeah. like me. When, no joke. When this box arrived, it had the yeah. new nose trimmer there. I was yeah. like, yes, I was I'm, excited. I'm about that. I'm about that weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmer. And uh, the performance package purchase also comes with two free gifts, the shed travel bag and the patented high performance reduced chafing manscaped boxers i put the boxers on they are nice they reduce chafing they're made of a very soft very high performance material and they've got a whole bunch of other products on their website to help maximize your confidence and grooming game not to mention your lawn care metaphors get 20 percent off and free shipping with our code tire at manscaped.com 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use our code TIRE. It's time you level up from the Amazon to the Amadong. <laughs> Imagine getting paid to write this. Love it. With the ultimate bushwhacking tools from Manscaped. Man, hiring copywriters now at Manscaped. Got a gardening metaphor? Bring it on. Also brought to you to, in part today by ButcherBox. Thanksgiving is coming, baby. And here's something to think about. ButcherBox turkey. It's on, dude. Peace of mind with ButcherBox because they take the guesswork out of finding high-quality meat and seafood you can trust. I'm talking about grass-fed beef, free-range chicken, pork raised out of the crate, and wild-caught seafood, all humanely raised with no antibiotics or added hormones. Get what you want delivered right to your doorstep with free shipping in the continental U.S. and no surprise fees. There's so many box plan options from curated to customized and changed 
change your plan whenever you want. There are exclusive member deals so you can save big on the cuts. Enjoy a range of high quality cuts that are hard to come by at the grocery store at an amazing value. I get that butcher box and then I've got meat for the month. It's my favorite thing to just, when I leave for work, I pull that meat out of the freezer and then I know what vegetables to get. I could do the cast iron uh, filet mignons in the pan. I can use the burger meat to make my famous ragu. It is fantastic, but it's all about Thanksgiving this month, and the main course for Thanksgiving can sometimes be a main source of stress. Not anymore. ButcherBox is offering our listeners free turkey with their first order. So sign up today at ButcherBox.com slash tire and use code tire to get one 10 to 14 pound turkey free in your first box. That's ButcherBox.com slash tire and use code tire to get a 10 to 14 pound turkey free in your first box. All right, folks, on today's episode of the show, so proud to have my new friend, Salika Talbot, in studio. Uh, Salika has been on all three sides of the societal uh, car angle. She has been in the government. She was the COO for the New Jersey Department of Transportation. She's worked as a corporate attorney defending both Ford and Toyota in class action lawsuits. And she now works as an, an advocate for the consumer as a professor here in California, teaching a college level course on transportation and mobility, as well as as a consultant for a EV and EV companies looking to find more equitable solutions and applications for their product. I think she is incredibly smart, has so many interesting things to say, and I loved this conversation so much. Um, so enjoy 90 minutes of great radio with Salika Talbot on the Smoke and Tire Podcast. And don't forget, the best way to get the Smoke and Tire Podcast is through Patreon, patreon.com slash the Smoking Tire Podcast. You can listen to the live stream as it's recorded. You can Ask your questions to me and Zach for the crew shows and for our guests. You can get an advertising free listening experience, both in audio and video. You can get the shows the day they're recorded rather than waiting for Tuesday to Thursday. And you can get an extra podcast every month, nine shows a month at our top tier Patreon level. Get it all at patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast. Salika, thank you for your time. I really appreciate you joining us. I'm thrilled to be here today. When you, uh, you were like, when I left Germany, I was like, that is who I need to talk to for 90 minutes. Because okay. you, and, and good good on Rob and Riley for putting you as a closer. Because your, your talk, which was like seven minutes, was like an excellent steamroller of a closing speech. Thank you. Sometimes when I'm in that moment and I'm so passionate about mobility, I don't often check myself, and so I've put it no, all no. out there. No, no, it was, dude, I was looking over at Alex Troy like, this bitch is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was great because the to, to boil your, and, and I want you to, to, to go into your thoughts on everything you said there and more, but just to boil it down to the essence of it, you're in a room full of very smart people, leaders in various fields, people who are inventing shit and developing shit and seeing their view of the future, and you basically say, hey, don't leave here without making sure that what you're building actually helps people in an equitable way, and you're not just building toys for rich guys, and you're not just figuring out how to sucker money out of investors. <laughs> and I loved that. I thought it was so important that all these inventions and this tech actually makes people's lives better. I think the, the, the part about speaking to, listen, it was, that's a brain trust, a yeah. global brain trust, who are the inventors of the future. But, but I think that conversation should happen across the spectrum. I'm an adjunct, I teach you know, students who are real estate developers and urban planners. And I also want them to have that 360 view. When they start the, the first day of class and I do the raise your hand and go through three or four things with them, I realize that they don't even have a grasp of what's out there. And yeah. the people who are inventing don't even know who they are inventing for or how they're impacting people. And then of course, just the average everyday citizen 
what is their educational history understanding of transportation yeah. and how critical it is to some people. Yeah. And it's especially like in this country where we've had a certain type of transportation, the car, right. sort of thrust onto us and and had it positioned as this sort of all important part of being an American and American life and and certainly when I was growing up in the 1990s, it was like car equals freedom. Yes. And it was like one to one. Right. And that's, I feel, being broken down by digital communications and stuff like that. But like, give us, if you don't mind, your version of the last hundred years of transportation <laughs> in America. And you are an expert in this. Bad, bad, and bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you know, my tagline is transportation is mobility and mobility is freedom. I am a first generation American and I always add that in there because I want to make sure I'm clear on the perspective. Very highly educated parents who were educated in America. Where were they from? My mother was from the island of Jamaica and my father from Kenya. Hmm. And they were educated at an HBCU in Washington DC and and then my mother became a teacher and a principal 30 years educating students in in New York. I can't get rid of this this crazy New York accent. Where with, where with pride, yo? You're good. <laughs> okay, so I'm from Long Island. I really am from New York. Um, My wife's from Long Island. It's okay. We can forgive you. Uh, thank you very much. But there's a lot of interesting transportation drama well, about that, Long Island. And 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 the important part about that is, I grew up with this. If you get a good education, you can do anything you want. The sky's the limit. And I was a middle class kid in a, sub, a suburb in Long Island. It was probably driving around in my parents' car from the time I was 13 or 14, and it was accessible. I know, <laughs> and they call me Mrs. D.O.T. now. <laughs> accessible, and, um, and there was nothing that was kept from me, right? I had the availability and access to everything. And in that mind's eye, I presume that everybody else can just pick themselves up and have that same opportunity and access. And it really wasn't until I went to college and, and I'm a, a parent of a, you know, my husband and I have a, a, a family that's 26 years old child, a 23 year old child, and son who just turns 18 this week and a 14 year old daughter. So we're spanning mm -hmm. um, a lot of years. I don't want my kids to go to college and hear some crazy crap from some professor standing in front of the room that's either too far to the right or too far to the left. But when I went to college, that's where I learned about the US's investments in apartheid because they were a part of the diamond industry in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I got into this mindset of advocacy, like people are being harmed. What can the United States do as a country? We're supposed to be the best in the world. That's why my parents came here. What can we do as a country to make it better? Mm -hmm. Fast forward, now I'm in the transportation space because I'm a poli-sci major with a minor in social legal studies. I left that biomedical engineering major and said, I, I, I'm gonna advocate, I wanna, I wanna be a lawyer. And in my classes, they started to tell us how the, the New York State Thruway and the parkways in Long Island on the, you know, the northern state and southern state that span the breadth of the island, and they were built purposely with low overpasses yeah. so that buses wouldn't bring black and brown people from the city out to the shores of Long Island. That was crazy. The Hutch as well, Hutch, Hutch River Parkway, Park, right? the Merritt Parkway Absolutely. as well, the Sawmill. Correct. I lived in Westchester County. Right. So same Very thing. Very much the same, same thing. Same thing, going north. And growing up, it was just like a novelty almost that you couldn't have trucks and buses Idyllic on this. Idyllic and bucolic is well, how we looked oh, at it yeah, back yeah. then. But, and yeah. every once in a while, a truck would sneak on and, and <laughs> razor, the, <laughs> razor the top <laughs> off. And and we were kind of taught, you know, naively that, oh, just things weren't that tall at the time. But right. like, horse shit, they were. They, they, they absolutely de they were. They definitely were. Like, this is by design. This It's not even just by design. It was political policy. Yeah. So... It's not three guys in a room by themselves. It is your politicians, the government, the ruling class who are making decisions that are essentially physically blocking people from accessing the fullness of the communities around them. And we keep doing that over and over again. We're, we still do it. Right. Like we're doing it now. Well, hopefully conversations like this get people to realize that we're down that road with electric vehicles and mm -hmm. certainly with 
I believe EV is the way to AV. So if we're doing it for electric vehicles, we'll be doing the same crap for AVs. We got to stop and pause for a second and say we had policies that built the interstate highways with covenants for mortgages that said you can't give a mortgage to a black person, but we'll give you we'll allow you to have money to build the houses. Right. right? And we'll build the roadways to take people from the cities out to the suburbs so they can have their patch of grass and have their beautiful life. And we'll exclude exclude black and brown people from those existences with physical barriers, with physical barriers. And for anybody who wants to think that that was 100 years ago or 50 years ago, we were doing that in this country 30 years ago and even in some places 20 years ago. And the and there's really obvious examples of it when you look. The consequences um, are crazy. Yeah, Levitt houses. Levitt house. And you you said you grew up in a Levitt house. I grew up in a Levitt house. And one of my I listened to to the Dollop podcast, which is a history podcast, and the story about Levittown and William Levitt is insane. Right. And it's not that far back. It's not. Um, and it's and it's not just a you know we're sitting and looking at Long Island. If we look at the city of Los Angeles. Yeah. I mean, consistently pushing highway through black and brown communities. and The 10 freeway right here into Santa Monica was just like. Right. And, the, and the repercussions of that are when I displace 5,000 families, the 5,000 families don't pick up and move someplace together. Those 5,000 families scatter. So not only is their generational wealth gone, the culture dissipates. And that's really my fear when I look at electrification Mm -hmm. and mining, whether we're doing it in the Imperial Valley or we're doing it in South Sudan or in the Lithium Triangle in South America. Well, that was what I learned from the guy who was talking about lithium mining. I was like, oh man, in order to clean up our local urban air, we are gonna fuck people's lives up somewhere we can't see. Decimate cultures. Yeah, that's that's a major, major Languages will be lost. Yeah. Ways of life will no longer exist. Yeah. And and we have people who are starting companies all over the US. I'm building EV bikes and I'm building EV cars and they're patting themselves on the back because they're gonna make the environment better. And Whose environment? It's this American notion, we're making us better and we haven't given two thoughts about the other guy. Yeah. Um, and, and we have to stop because here's the other part of that. I have to care what happens to the other guy. For example, when I'm mining in, in the southern parts of California because I want to make my life better in other places, if I mine there but they can't afford electric vehicles, we haven't made the air quality better. Yeah. Right, because they're not driving electric vehicles. Not if they're 150,000 a pop, or if the average car note in America is seven hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars a month, and you make twenty or thirty or even forty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. How do you do that and have a house and, yeah. and put food on the table? Well, and you. So your your background is as a, as an attorney, yes. but also you can speak to this because you ran the DOT in an entire state, in New Jersey. Is that, I ha- is, that, I have, is that an accurate description? What is I, I the think title the, I exactly? think the administrator might um, Sorry. might have something to say about that, but I was the chief operating officer. Chief operating officer of, of the of the DOT, the Motor Vehicle Commission for the state of New Jersey. That's a that's not a lightweight gig. That's a real gig. It's a real thing. And so you are, and New, when you think of New Jersey, you yeah. think of DOT. I can't think of, other than like Springsteen <laughs> and uh, Snooky, I can't think of anything that represents Jersey more than transit and highways. I mean, the New Jersey Turnpike might be the most famous highway in the country. And the most densely populated state with a horrible public transit system. Right. Yeah. It's, New Jersey is driving. Correct. Either in it or through it. Absolutely. You know, and I and I grew up in Westchester County, and I went to the University of Pennsylvania. So, so I was on that corridor. You know, my easy pass with. <laughs> so you know, I know. So from your experience, are electric vehicles even good? Hmm. We we as a nation, as a people, it's it's like we. We have to grab onto the next thing, and we can't grab onto it a little bit. We gotta go full steam ahead, 100% all in, and then we start to learn the lessons. <laughs> we don't like tip our toe in and say, is the water hot, yeah. is it cold, is it deep, is it shallow? No, we, just, we YOLO. We just 
all in. <laughs> do, do you think that's because so many people in America are trying to find the next gold rush? So rather than us casually dipping our toe in like investigating, you have all these guys that or people that just go, oh, well, if, if this is the next moneymaker, like, and so they're going to go full send. Of course it is. Yeah. E- that's what's really driving policy. The policy isn't being driven by environmentalists. They may want to think that that's the case, but that's not. It's big dollars that influence the politician who then says, yes, we're going to go all EV. But even in doing so, if you kind of look behind the curtain at some of these EV political decisions, guidelines and policy, and even funding opportunities, they don't know what the hell they're doing. Yeah, and I I've say that with Senate all due respect. Before. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. And part of the problem is, and I say it respectfully, often the people in government, and I was one of those myself, don't possess the requisite knowledge for the lived experiences for the people who are the making decisions for. Mm. So here's an example. I am now in academia and I'm talking to people across the country about electrification and and how we get people to move to EVs. And somebody heading one of the largest customer EV associations says to me, it's gonna be fabulous. We're all gonna have to plug in either at home or at work to charge and it'll be just a great new world. No blank are, spots there at are, all. Are you kidding no, me? No blind spots whatsoever. People live in high-rise neighborhoods. Yeah. Where are they plugging in? And my other problem, I got lots of them, equity. For the love of God, I just, I really want people to retire the word because they're not using it correctly. Equity is not black or white, and it is not rich or poor. It is opportunity and access. So the rich person on the Upper East Side of Manhattan has just as much a problem obtaining access to a charging station as a person who's living in a poor neighborhood in in Sheep's Head Bay. It's the same thing. There's opportunity and access issues. And when the government says, we're gonna give you money to create a charging infrastructure, oh, we're gonna get money? We're just gonna throw that crap in the ground wherever we go, like they're like they're watering the, the least, grass the by least sp- resistance, okay. just sprinkling the least resistance, them yeah. wherever they want with no policy behind where they're putting them. And I think importantly, and this is back from my motor vehicle days, no repair or maintenance plan. Yeah, that's the craziest part. It's not because to me, I have I have an EV uh, among I have six weird old stupid cars and one and one EV because it's pleasant to drive in traffic in Los Angeles. Okay. Straight up, I'm not saving the world. I'm just a little more relaxed when I get somewhere. And I have a house where I can plug it in, and I have an office where you I can, can plug, plug it in. in. But I often I try to go on road trips and I try to use it out in the world so that I can experience what people want. Right. The number of times I have gotten to a charger and that doesn't, doesn't work. work are staggering. And I complain about it on social media and I hear because I have an audience, I hear from the people and whoa, whoa you know, blah, blah, blah. And they've told me, you know, off the record, they pay us to build them. They don't pay they us don't. to fix them, which is wild. So here's the problem. Here's how that started, right? When we come up with these environmental solutions, we're gonna make sure that we do emissions checks on all vehicles. This this government says we're gonna do it and states realize that there's money both to be made and because of the environments that they're in. They're gonna build these emission stations throughout Oh, you think that's gonna be a national standard? I'm gonna tell you how they got that wrong. And if government would pay attention to the mistakes they've made in the past, this is all about that history and education, they wouldn't be making the same mistakes that they are right now Hmm. with the EV charging system. So in New Jersey and in almost every other state where we had large populations and emission stations, people, when they first started, you know, you had to have your car inspected every other year, every year, the lines were crazy long and people were frustrated. Governors lost their jobs. Motor vehicle commissioners and people in those places lost their jobs. And the reason they did is not because they didn't build the emissions equipment and infrastructure, they didn't have maintenance agreements mm. and repair agreements and uptimes built in. And the general public, that's my political economy of, the general public was like, you know what? I don't care how much money the inventor, creator, or builder of that emission state station gave that politician, 
Me waiting two and three hours to get my vehicle inspected is just a bridge too far. Sure. And they start ousting politicians. And then what happened is the next time these things came up for new contracts, they built in repair and maintenance agreements. And well, then it was the, not such a problem. And anymore. then it wasn't. So, look, lo and behold, you're not in line for three hours anymore yeah. because we built those in. I see where this is going. Yeah. The number. Whenever I complain about it, I complain about it, not to turn people off to EVs, but to motivate the people running the show who I know see it and I know because they tell me. <laughs> right. That get your shit together. Because it's it's the system should work and it's not and, and it doesn't work because of solved problems. It's just it's it's putting people on the thing and customer service in telling us when the station is down and don't go there. So I don't get stranded in the but desert. But if my commitment is just to the dollar, yeah. I'm gonna throw them in and I don't care. And if the people who are making decisions are appointees without a breath of experience, mm-hmm. because one of the reasons I see this is I've worked for both Industry, as an attorney, as a product liability defense attorney, I've worked for state government, I've worked for federal government, and I work in academia. I can see in each one of those spaces the things they get right and the things they get wrong. Me talking about this stuff is not because I don't want us to move to new mobility. I'm talking about it because I want us to be able to adopt it with reliability. Yeah. And you can't get to reliability without maintenance. If, with, without maintenance. Yeah. yeah. So is... To, to circle back around, if we can get that right, if, and if we can find a way to produce metals for batteries without completely wrecking parts <laughs> of the world, right. are, is the mass push to EVs a good idea? Because one of the things that bugs me is let's all save the world and make a huge profit at it. And I feel like these are diametrically opposed ideas in a lot of ways. I think there's money to be made in the industry. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should be running away from, there's gonna be profit in it. People are gonna be successful as they innovate and they create. But it's that jumping in the pool instead of tipping your toe in. There will be and there are other means of fueling your vehicles. Norway, who we used to hold up as like this shining light, like Norway got it right. They got their their community to move to EVs and yeah. move away from ICE vehicles. In a harsh climate, no less. In a harsh climate. You know what Norway's doing now? They had a lot of incentives. You can ride in the HOV lanes if you have an EV. You don't have to pay tolls if you have an EV. I think there was no, you're ta- getting no, no sales tax You're getting on no the sales tax. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They had a, 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 essentially a toolkit to encourage people to get electric vehicles. And people, and a, it's a monolith, monolithic community, so it's easier there, right? It's not state after state with different governors saying and doing different things, but they got people on board. And you know what they're doing now? They're clawing back all the incentives. And the reason they're clawing back the incentives is I think something that the U.S. should be looking at. They're not clawing back because they don't have enough money that they're getting because they're giving you these incentives. They're clawing it back because it did nothing for congestion. Yeah. They're clawing it back because there's still too many people on the roadway. Uh, yeah. And they understand that it has to be an ecosystem. Mm-hmm. It's this, so here in the U.S., you have the people who are like, we're all going to get on bikes and we're gonna bike around the United States and we don't need those stinking cars. And every one of those people that are saying that, I wanna say, do you have three kids and, and dry cleaning and groceries to pick up? And you live in the Northeast? Yeah. Like, like some things are just unreasonable and frankly ridiculous. <laughs> but we're so mired in our own personal experiences that we can't see what we're pushing for somebody else. If you create an ecosystem that says, Maybe the shared, you know, the shared shuttle that's an AV that comes into my neighborhood picks up every 15 minutes and drops people at a train station or at a bus stop. And then they take that to where they're going and then the reverse is available on the other side. And that people who can bike, we're happy to have you bike. I don't want to bike. And you might but, not always use it, but on the days when you don't have groceries and three kids, it may, it's, 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 it's there and it's available yeah. for you to use. 
But we also need to look at what else is happening in society around us. Because black and brown men who may want to bike ride in different communities across America might find themselves on an unpleasant receiving line of traffic enforcement officers. Yeah, you mentioned that in Germany. It was a wild statistic that in a city like L.A., where everyone's being encouraged to bike, they're taking away car lanes and making bike lanes and and all this stuff that like a crazy amount of Hispanic men are being stopped just for riding bikes. Right, so the the percentage from the, I believe it was the LA Times had done an expose on this. They did their research, called enforcement stops, and in Los Angeles, the enforcement stops for people who were riding their bicycles is 70 something percent Hispanic male in a city where they don't make up anywhere near that number. Yeah. Um, so they go to law enforcement and they say, hey, we, we looked at all the summonses and the traffic stops and we've, we, we've done some, some data research here and we, we can show you that this is the percentage of people who are being stopped by you. And I, I listen, I, I wasn't a point C who had to answer reporters' questions. I would have probably, you know, hit a brick or something at that yeah. point. Sheriff is like, they're not writing for pleasure. Neither am I. I'm trying to get to work, yo. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I brought my bike to work. <laughs> Holy shit. But also, yeah. why does it matter? The, the if, quiet part out loud. Right, yeah. yeah. Who cares why they're riding um, a bicycle? He said what other traffic enforcement officers are probably saying and thinking around the country. Again, this is part of a systemic issue. Um, the average enforcement officer, I'm not picking on officers. We need them to protect our communities. But I'd rather you protect my community than be looking for me to commit a traffic infraction. The average uh, traffic enforcement officer in the United States writes $300,000 in traffic tickets each year, the average. So somebody's like way over that. They then, you go to court and you have court fees on top of that. Yeah, there is a financial ecosystem with that kind of stuff. Right, so you have communities where more than 10% of their revenue for the operating budget of that community is based on law enforcement writing tickets. Sure. You, you, that should not be sustainable. There's a bunch, like there's a town um, in South Carolina where uh, I've, I've done some vacationing and there's a, a town called Bluffton that has a very, very famous, the Bluffton speed trap. Yes. And it's like, you know, 55, and then there's about 100 yards of like 25. <laughs> and then right back. And then right back to 55. And it was an astronomical portion of over 50% of the town's annual budget was the Bluffton speed trap. We have that in Alabama and parts of Louisiana. Yeah. And the other piece of that is in those spaces, getting the, those tickets are not a traffic violation, they are a criminal violation. So when we talk about people having records, a lot of time the record is based on a traffic enforcement stop. These are things the federal government could wipe away with the, with the twirl of their pen. Yeah. I don't care. I mean, in truth, because I don't smoke, I don't care if people smoke. I care when you use that to entrap people, create records, and make it impossible for them to be upwardly mobile. I want people to be safe you on the weed. roadways. But, yeah, you weed. meant weed. Yeah. Okay. To clarify. Weed. I want people to drive safely on the roadway. I, I, I want you to be able to get to that destination. I want us to reduce our crashes and fatalities. But a lot of that enforcement is not actually has nothing that. to do with that. Yeah, if, yeah. if you're mad that my rosary beads are swinging <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm going, right, it's an obstruction. When I'm riding down the highway, <laughs> you're full of crap. Yeah. And and we make. The, the legal field is making a lot of money off of it, I, you know. Well, and it could be justification for all other kinds of crazy stuff that <sighs> right, we certainly then we do don't that, want And happening. then all the other things that, that, yeah. that attend yeah. with that. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do, and I think we, we have to look at it as an ecosystem. Yeah. Each mode sort of fitting within the other, and that's why something I say at every chance I get, um, we need someone who is a mobility czar that is sitting at a higher level than a DOT office or a Department of Energy because you need a whole of government perspective. How's Mayor Pete doing? (sighs) That damn equity word, stop. (laughs) Stop, if anybody in his office is listening, stop. You're gonna equity us to death and what you are doing is, language matters. I could say the same thing about the same thing 
I hear I'm beating over your head that you must use the words climate change and you must acknowledge that there's climate change. But if I said there was economic development possibilities for your community and funding available so that you could do workforce development and that you could uh, bring in more money through your commerce departments, these states that are like FU right now when it comes to environmental sustainability and climate change would be all too well on board. But you don't want to concede. Don't tell them what they're building. Right. You don't want to <laughs> concede that, that, that word. Right. And it's, you know, you're throwing down the gauntlet at the expense of who? Your own people. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think that um, I think they're trying. I know. Look at it like this. I'm the Secretary of Transportation, Mayor Pete. I'm going to go tell the Secretary of Labor what to do or the Secretary of Energy. They're, they're all equals. And I have my fiefdom. And I don't want you on my territory telling yeah. me what to do and vice versa. The only way that you get consistency across the board is someone at the White House level saying, okay, you guys all come in. We're going to come up with a whole of government policy Mm -hmm. that is going to be overseen out of the White House because mobility is is something that touches every single part of humanity, whether it's healthcare or food or housing or jobs, any and everything we do whether you go to goods and services or goods and services comes to you, has a transportation mobility component. Sure. So, and yet, everything you just said, and yet, it seems like all the policies are totally laser focused on personally owned cars. Doesn't it? Or am I just misreading the room? I don't think you're misreading the room because we, we still can't get it. We can't get away from ourselves. Even this notion that we understand we have, you know, driven highways, pardon the pun, through community and mm-hmm. and, and taken over land eminent domain and built the ten and all kinds of other highways. We're gonna make it better. And we're just not gonna make that a highway anymore. We're gonna we're gonna pave over it and have community space and where the hell are cars going? Yeah. I mean are you going to put them on the surface streets now? Elon's going to build us all tunnels, like don't you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, the, like the smog isn't bad there already? Yeah. And so you think those people need a park more than they need a job or a housing that they can afford to live in or good food in their neighborhood? Like like your priorities. Well, that's – you're. I, I agree. The cars do need to go somewhere. But also it seems like adding – lanes and more roads is counterproductive. We, right. we don't We're not to, doing that. We don't need to add right. a single road. Just just stop. So he's saying just stop with the building of the roads. Pause. Just let it just right. let that be. The the more you widen the roadway, mm-hmm. the greater the usage right. of that roadway. Induced demand. Correct. Yes. Which I uh, I'm sure you read the book Traffic by Tom I have Vanderbilt. read the book yeah. Traffic. Yes. Is there any are there other books that you like about traffic that um, I should that I should read because I like studying traffic. You know, I think that that we're there are a lot of books out there, smart streets and you know mobility. Um, but I think that when we look at articles that are written on almost a daily basis across um, mobility spaces with lived experience, I think you're getting more out of that than you are by reading a book. Of course, we need to understand redlining America, and mm-hmm. of course, we need to know the history of our roadways in America. But but for some people, history is a bad thing, right? They keep, they're like, well, that was then. Yeah, yeah. Right? What's that got to do with me? So read the articles of today sure. that are showing you how those decisions are still impacting people's lives in a negative way to give you the opportunity to get it right. Yeah, that's like the, we need to judge these people by their time. And it's like, I bet you there was people in their time saying this shit was fucked yeah. up. Yeah, You just don't like hearing from them. It's um, hard. Yes, it you is. Know. So, I mean, I think that having certain areas, our most dense areas, be for limited car use where things are walkable mm-hmm. could be good. And other areas that are further spread out already, we don't need to like totally bulldoze every neighborhood, you know. So so just let's unpack that for a second, Mm -hmm. right? It's a downtown or inner city community, heavily congested. 
you're not going to have personal ownership of your vehicles. But if you live out in the suburbs or in rural spaces, you will have greater access to vehicles. That's what I was trying to say. You going to tell me what's wrong with that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can't help myself. No, <laughs> please. No, listen. I, I have no um, ego about this. Tell me what's wrong with it. I think it sounds nice in theory, but... When I have to get to work, and my getting to work is dependent on a public transportation system that often doesn't run reliably and on time, but you get your car and, and have greater access or opportunity, you're gonna look like you care more about your job than mm -hmm. I do, right? The, the, it seems like nuances, but listen, I can remember when I had staff that had to come to work every day, and what I used to, call the stories because I was living in my own bubble. Wonder what they're going to say today about the train. Right. They do really have a problem with the yeah, train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So what about, I mean, if I examine places where it at least appears from the outside to, to work, to limit vehicles, right? Um, the, the center of Amsterdam where I vacationed a couple years ago and it was pretty amazing without cars where they're doing in Times Square in New York City, mm -hmm. um, select sections. You know, you can walk a couple blocks either way and be at your car. I'm not right. talking about make, putting someone miles from their car. I'm talking about very select, small areas. Is that an option or is that, is, is, what do you see as what could work other than increase public transportation access? The policies around, I'll use Times Square in New York City because I, it's a space I know well. People went batshit when they did that. Of course that. they went batshit. New Yorkers, they, you know, we do what we want when we right. want. Right, but now it seems like it's not so bad. Well, you live with it, and in truth, whose neighborhood are you harming in that case? Who really lives in Times Square? Yeah, idiots. It's, <laughs> I'm sorry. Very few. It's, it's all the businesses. Yeah, yeah. And so what was taking place at the time is really to support the dollar. Mm hmm to, to make sure the business, and they're not small businesses. No, it's the, corporations the corporate that have a Times right, Square. Right. Uh, Disney and all of these other big companies, Nike sitting in Times Square, their businesses are benefited because you have to walk past them. You don't drive past them mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. the, this is in support of the almighty dollar and the visitor. So maybe we shut down cars on Rodeo. Maybe we shut down cars on parts of Santa Monica. Maybe we shut down cars in the middle of Manhattan Beach where, where all the stores are and that kind of stuff and, and not where people live. I think it's a great idea, but again, that, that political economy, go ahead, shut down those yeah. roadways around, around Rodeo yeah, Drive. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great idea, right? <laughs> I know the guy who literally owns Rodeo right. Drive. This shit ain't happening. Of course it's not. <laughs> and, that's the, and that's the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Somebody in a, in a policy-making position says, I want to shut down these four communities, the ones that you named, right? And let's throw, you know, Redondo Beach is in there and maybe San Pedro and, you know, we'll... And the first three are like, hell no, you're not closing down these streets. But the sort of the weaker link that doesn't have either the political power or the, the monetary power to make decisions, mm -hmm. to push government, or to push back against your sort of fellow equals in the community. Sorry, you're San Pedro, you're out of luck. You're screwed. <laughs> you're screwed. Well, yeah. that's how they got all that industry in the first place. Sorry, you're out of luck. Right. And now we're going to make policies, and sorry, they're going to be out of luck. Mm -hmm. We're building EVs. I talked to someone yesterday about you know, the lithium mining that will take place in the Imperial Valley. And in th this gentleman's particular community, of a little over 20,000, they have two EV charging stations in the entire. What the hell? Isn't that crazy what when you? What the hell? It, when you have industry in an area that it like clearly doesn't serve, or like whenever I drive up north up uh, Highway 395, which is a beautiful drive up through Lone Pine and Big Pine up to to Big Bear, when mm -hmm. I like to go skiing, there is a Dasani bottling plant in the middle of the desert, like. How does this happen? <laughs> there's no water here. Right, but there's a right. but there's a bottling plant putting it in bottles and sending it somewhere else to Rodeo Drive. Probably. Right. No, they drink Voss. Please on Rodeo Drive. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, well, how I guess I guess there's a start of saying if you're going to build a, a plant or a mine in this community, you better serve this community first, right? I got a plan. You got a plan for that? So I'm calling it the pledge. And it's a five-point plan. It's it is in very raw stage right now, but I I I share it because the first company that signs on to it is going to shame the rest of them into doing the right thing. Education is key to all of this. So every, you know how we have to learn how to run, hide, fight, unfortunately. Every job you're at, you got to watch the videos, know where the exits are. Mm -hmm. Everybody who is working in transportation, but most especially in companies that are using batteries, you have to have education modules around the transportation systems in the United States and how they got built. You start there. Then the second prong is workforce development. I'm going into places where they're indigenous communities, where people don't have the skills to work in these, in these jobs. We're not upskilling anybody. Like, we'll take a janitor or two, but we don't have the jobs for you. We're gonna fly in our engineers and fly in our technologists. You're just in the stages of mapping out where you're gonna build. You have time to educate people. Mm -hmm. You have time to upskill people, and you'll be putting back some of that money in that community that you're taking from. Um, the third part is literally my product liability defense lawyer brain saying, like asbestos, like the breast implants, like almost anything that we jumped in the deep end, we're gonna have some health issues eventually. We know that. You're mining, and the people who live in and around the spaces where you are mining, they will most likely have some health implications. Let's set up health funds today. Let's get baselines for people in these communities today. So if you're testing them every two years or every four years, you know if there is impact to this group as a whole based on what you're doing, and you can intervene rather than the asbestos commercial 25 years later to say, yeah. did you work on such and such? And if you do, here comes you know, the shady lawyer to jump in and, and get money for your family while you die. Let's, let's start with those health funds today. Advisory councils for each one of these companies from the community. The powerful part about this is, again, my lawyer brain. As a company, if I don't hear from you on a regular basis, I don't know what's happening and I have plausible deniability. Mm -hmm. That's you also why they wouldn't want to test and do baseline. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you have an advisory committee of the community that is reporting back to you on impact in that community with the sure. op the opportunity to, to, to intervene, then you should take that opportunity now. This is good governance. Yeah. Right? You want to, we want to make money. I'm not, I'm not denying want to make money. I want to make money too. Here's a way to ensure the value of your stock for your stockholders. And then the fifth is the research innovation piece. Let's invest in research that says, I don't need lithium and cobalt to power these vehicles. And if you're not investing in them, all this energy is battery, 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 battery. We know someone's gonna invent and create something. Yeah. It's just a matter of time. Well, let's put, let's put enough effort into that today so that we can stave off these uses. I like it. What are, because I never actually got this specific, I should have asked somebody in Germany, but I didn't. What are the, the expected negative impacts to a given community that has a lithium mine in it is water it water it's water right water water yeah but there you know you, is it because you need the water you need so to, much water to extract to extract it and so is it just the taking of the water or is it the poisoning of water or it both? is both uh. it is both um in places in south america where they literally have to displace the community right there again um, sort of filtering out the community, They're not picking all up and going one place. And in some of these communities, they have very unique cultures, yeah, yeah. very unique languages or dialects that will be lost. Yeah. Can you, I mean, you, you're literally making a community extinct. And we're like, well, environmental sustainability. Yes. You don't understand. The air quality in Los Angeles could be cleaner. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and your language isn't helping us clean that air. Right. I mean, that's the interesting like macro problem when um, I think when the reports about India's uh, 
um, air quality and Chinese air quality were you know getting a lot of press, and the West was basically saying, oh, you guys need to calm down with this coal thing. And someone, I think, from India was like, look, you guys had your industrial revolution. Right. It's not fair of you to say that we can't have ours, which is a, a really strong point. <laughs> I mean, that's putting but an America, ace on the deck. Yeah. Right, but yeah. America goes, wow, we have all the things we need, so <laughs> right, how about you know, right. everybody else clean up our house for yeah. it? Um, so this photo is what a bunch of lithium mines look like, right? And they're, yeah. they're these big yeah. kind of square pools. Famous photo, uh, this is in South America, and the stat here is that it requires 2.2 million gallons of water uh, to mine one ton of lithium. Yeah. So between, I think, splitting the earth and then soaking it and refining it and all the other things that are happening here, that just uses a lot of water. That's a lot of water. That looks, I mean, I can't, I can't for certain say that a big y nuclear yellow pool looks, is, is bad, but it looks pretty bad. It, pretty it doesn't cool. look like the kind of thing that's healthy for what's around This it. is where Gatorade is grown. <laughs> yeah. You certainly don't want that right next to you, yet yeah. we are... I pick you for your lands. Right, right, right. And that's where we're going to put we, it. Nobody, I mean, nobody wants a coal plant or a nuclear plant or any kind of plant Nobody next wants to them. anything. Nobody wants anything next to them, but someone's got to get it, and it's not going in Bel Air. Oh, quick correction. 2.2 million liters of water, not oh. gallons. Still a lot of water. Still a lot Still of water. Still a bunch of water, yeah. yeah. So think about the issues that we're having, not just as a nation, but as a globe, in terms of drought. Yeah. We, we have water issues as mm -hmm. it is, yeah. right? And we figured out what to do with the water that we have. Is it, is it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and someone else who was um, speaking in Germany said, brought out a chart of what uses, uh, what, 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 what makes emissions in globally. And I believe it was 11% was per passenger cars. And that's not nothing, but that's, it's not that much to it's, make to make everybody to to force all the manufacturers to convert, uh, you know, to electric to make everybody buy electric to force a new infrastructure. And it seems like what is happening is, okay, here's what's going to save the planet, and consumers need to buy stuff in order to do it. Ring, ding, ding. As opposed to some very profitable industries need to be a little less less profitable and update to cleaner methods of doing what they do. So the, the, the change that's going to save the world is figuring out to have people part with the dollars in their pocket. Um, and who's pushing that? If you think about it, people have been talking about EVs for a long time. Tesla didn't get on the, the, the market last year. The companies who, after Tesla, the large um, global companies who are like, we are going to be 100% EV. We're not even going to like sell half and half or yeah. 70. We're, we're going to be 100%. Yeah, EVs are like a 5% market share in America. And they're like, in 10 years, it's going to be 100. You're like, wow, that's an awfully big gap to close, isn't it? Well, Well, if you think about it from their end, it's almost genius because you're going to have to change <laughs> yeah. right and I'm and I'm the thing you need yeah yeah so you're gonna sp you may have held on to your car longer cars you know we used to get rid of them much quicker now we're holding on to our vehicles longer but I'm I've I found a way to make you part with it mm -hmm. and then I went to Washington and I convinced the federal government that there should be dates and times for the for the change and the federal government yes we should have those dates and times for the change well is it is it interesting that the private manufacturers got the same deadline to be 100% EV that the federal government is saying you got to be yeah. I, I mean how that happen I, um, my guess <laughs> is that they when they make the announcement they get the credit for forward thinking on page A1 of mm, the paper. Right. And when they walk it back in four or five years, it's going to be on page B17. Of that's course. my guess. I'm not like smart, but that's my guess. I, I, I think you're right. Or or even or even maybe in section D. Yeah, yeah. Um, Buried. They're going to have to, to reframe this. It's even the notion of, of EV charging infrastructure. It's the the game plan that the government creates when it says um, 
I'm going to give tax credits, but the tax credits will only serve if blank. Yeah. If you really wanted reliability and complete adoption, you would just say there are going to be tax credits, period. Mm -hmm. And then if you were worried about access and opportunity, you might cap it at a yeah. income level. Yeah. Or a cost of the vehicle level. Or a cost of the vehicle yeah, yeah. level. If the fact that you get that tax credit for a hundred thirty thousand dollar, you know, Tycon or Tesla versus, mm -hmm. you know, you have to get a Leaf or you have to get that's the law that's changing. I think in California, they're. I think right? they are changing. We had in John California. McGuire on. Yes, right. I believe, right. I believe they're right. changing. Because it, because it makes sense. It's dumb. Because um, it makes sense, and even, you know, they were sitting at this cap that people hadn't been able to use for Teslas for quite some time, and mm -hmm. now, you know, Tesla's going to get the benefit of it, maybe. U.S. cars are manufactured in Mexico. And Honda's got its big factory in Ohio. Ohio, yeah. A Mercedes in South Carolina and BMW in South Carolina. Who is really getting the benefit? I, are you propping up unions? Is that, is that the reason for it? Because these are still American workers. Amer they're, they're employed by an American company if they're building a Ford, wherever that Ford is built. This is an American company. Mm -hmm. And you have, again, not period, we gotta put a comma in there and add crap that doesn't make any sense that I imagine you will have to absolutely walk back at some point because nobody's making enough cars at a, um, a reasonable enough price point. Right. In yeah, order the average for the- $66,000. Correct, in order for the entire nation to make this turn. And yet you have put a comma instead of a period. Yeah. You gotta fix that. Yeah. I know it's an election. Listen, as a politician myself, I know it's an election year, but some things don't make any damn sense. And it's, it is infuriating. I was gonna say frustrating, but I clearly am past that. I'm <laughs> infuriated because the average citizen doesn't even understand half the crap that's coming out of the industry because we all talk to each other and like giddy with the new stuff. And the government is all gobbledygook with these extra commas and all this other language that they're sticking in there. And there isn't just a general education campaign. Like I have to explain it to you. Yeah. Because you're owed that. If we're if we're gonna change, seat change, the vehicles that the entire US is driving, yeah. it can't just be like I put out a press release. And I am also like I'm pro like hybrids, like plug in hybrids where you can have a battery pack that's much, much smaller. And the reliability. The reliability is better. And you can use that electric powertrain in urban areas and then use gas powertrain to not to go further and not, not rely on as much on public charging network, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, but it's, in, it's just interesting that we kind of skipped right over that to the, to the full EVs. I, I, I'm guessing it's because of lobbying or sure. profitability In industry or, yeah industry said it's, we're, it, we're not going to go that way what is your what are your thoughts on a, a new word that i learned in in germany mini mobility yeah. which they said was something between a scooter and an e-bike and an electric car sort of like a higher end golf cart like those gem things the the sort of lower speed electric kind of urban runabout type vehicles Listen, they're generally affordable ish right. You know, mm -hmm. ten, ten thousand dollars, eight, eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars, much cheaper than a new car. Right. They provide shelter in the elements. They can they have trunks, you know, and and they take up a little less space than a car. Not much, but a little bit. Worthwhile or a waste of time? I certainly can see you driving that around the villages in Florida. You know. The villages. <laughs> you found my summer home, though. <laughs> I told you I'm a New Yorker. I went down there. I got syphilis and a red oh, hat. Exactly. And I'm good to go. <laughs> the villages is New York South. Um, you know, in some communities, I'm sure that works perfectly no, fine. I live in Venice Beach here, and there's people it, that right. drive those things around, right. actually. Yeah. In but, California, I think if the speed limit is 35 or lower, hey, you can drive them. So what I will say is... The federal government is responsible for safety standards, for the FMVSSs, right? Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. And that's the apparatus, frankly, that keeps AVs off the road right now because mm. they 
have managed to not allow them to have widespread use. That's how we determine whether your Porsche or your BMW or whatever is safe to be on the roadway. But all states have operational authority over the vehicles that are on their roadways. Some states probably have written their laws today that makes it easy to traverse those states. I love to, with all due respect, call Florida the Wild West. Because there's no laws. Are you saying there's no laws in Florida? No, the law in Florida is do whatever you (laughs) want when it comes to it, right? Whatever. Just don't say climate change. Yeah, exactly. Don't say climate change. And they're doing it with... Florida's crazy. You can drive anything. Like almost crazy good in some ways because it says, here's the roadway. Enjoy. Utilize it. (laughs) And like whatever you figure out, come back and, you know, maybe share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then maybe we can best another state and then they'll want to do what we're doing. Uh Uh-huh. In Arkansas, you know, well, Asa, you can drive tractors on the road and can, stuff like that, and some can, states allow UTVs. Right. Arkansas says they want to be the transportation capital of the United States, and when I first heard that, I thought, Arkansas, are yeah. you out of your damn mind? What, what are mind? they doing to forward that mission? Every single thing <laughs> they can, and right. you know what? I'm not mad at them because can't say environmental sustainability or climate change, but they're like jobs, 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 more jobs, jobs, jobs. Come build here. Yeah. We'll, we have workforce that will help develop for you so that you'll have people to work in those spaces. We will make sure that our infrastructure is shored up so that you can move these vehicles on our roadway. Like they really are in partnership mm-hmm. with industry and, and pretty forward thinking. And it's Arkansas. California, well, you know. We like AVs because this is the seat of innovation. We're in California. Right. But we must be technological leaders. But we don't want AV trucks because the labor force. Mm-hmm. You what? still need you still need what? someone to do things though. We we have a truck driver shortage. Are you out of your damn mind? Like we didn't just live through all these supply chain crisis issues. A good part of that is is absolutely because of the lack of drivers in the industry and in freight and fleet. It's a 97% turnover. Yeah, they don't hold that, people for very long. Is that shortage though because their wages are basically unsustainable and people are upset about that? I don't the, know. The, the system asking. and scheme of paying a driver in some, in some places is based on the mileage. So if you're sitting in traffic, yeah, you know, someone's paying you 22 cents a mile, you're probably not making much money. I think I saw a John Oliver segment on that that was very good about people that had to sit at the stations for like 10 hours waiting Correct. for a Detention load and they're time, not getting paid. Right, yeah, it's, right. It's, Detention it's not a good time, system. Detention time is horrible. And, um, and I used to work for FMCSA. Um, I don't think the federal government has enough of a handle on that. And ports are their own country almost. Like, you're not telling us what to do in our fiefdom. Right. And when we get good and ready, then we'll... You run the we'll, docks, you run the city. Yes. You run the city, you, you run, run the state. state. And um, don't, not true any other place than California, so think about it. I remember the ships off the Port of the Long Beach ships, was crazy. And, then the, and fruits. Your fruit that you're putting on a truck here is going to feed somebody yeah. in a barrio in Harlem. Right. And it takes seven days to cross, six, seven days to cross the country... After it's done with Whole Foods and Wegmans, then the barrio gets whatever left over. There's no nutritional value, even if there's anything left over. If the AV is moving it because it's boring and it's horrible for you physically to sit six days driving across the country, the food gets there faster. And they I, get I don't think the technology is there quite yet to do that. I mean, we don't have a regulatory framework sure, that no. will even allow you to we test. Should. We, you're, you, we should. We should. 100%. We absolutely should. I'm with you. But just to circle back, because we, we started on golf carts and yes. ended up at trucks. Yes. Is there, in your ecosystem, where everything needs to kind of work together to improve mobility across the board, where do those golf cart type vehicles fit, or are they just kind of a half measure that doesn't get us anywhere? Well, the reason I started saying about state operational authority is a lot of states have written their laws that make that impossible. Mm. So I think they could be part of the ecosystem. And this may be something that as the federal government begins to look at um, crafting new legislation around AVs, 
they make new legislation around mobility policies. Those things shouldn't be everywhere. Right. No, no, they shouldn't. Right. But there may be spaces where they are accommodating better in that environment than the, than the private vehicle or even a TNC. Yeah. Right. So in the shore in New Jersey, I could think of it. In Martha's Vineyard, I mean, I could think of all types of ecosystems and places where that's probably the perfect vehicle. Sure. But we also have a mindset in this country. Every time we stripe a road and say that's the bike road, the car people are like, I don't know why they're taking up the road with yeah. this waste of time stuff. Yeah. And then the poor people who want a bike are like, I really want a bike, but damn, I want to get home safely yeah. and alive to my family. I'll be honest, like two years ago, before I really started really thinking about urbanism and stuff like that, when they did what was called the road diet um, through first on Venice Boulevard mm-hmm. and then on the beach. I was I was the guy in the car going, what the fuck is this fucking stupid? <laughs> and then I, I literally did a, a full 180 on it. Like later, once I started reading like Alyssa Walker and and articles from people that were like, um, can, can we have a, a voice in this too? Yes. And I was like, actually, they kind of have a point. Um, but that's the missing link. Right. Education. Yeah. People are going to... People are going to bitch and moan. Well, that's why I try to do these shows with people like yourself to show that you can be a car enthusiast and also want people to have other choices as opposed to like, I don't like traffic. Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I try to, I have an electric bike. I try to ride it. I ride a, a, I ride a Vespa. That's how I get around a lot. Like, lane splitting rules. Right. Like, you know, and so I try to like, bridge that gap between being a car enthusiast and also by the way I have a high density parking structure where people leave their vehicles when they're not using them so they can live in a high density area as opposed to having to live way out in Calabasas or somewhere and build a huge barn for their toys so and this is beautiful I mean th- what you safe. have built should be replicated Yes, in it should. Would you all- like to invest? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in communities all across the world. I love cars. I, I, you know, I took my class in the spring to the Peterson. I just oh, had my, cool. my class uh, a couple weeks ago. I took them the new class to the Peterson. Uh, you know, Bring I want to buy here. I want a Porsche Taycan. That's that's that's, and I want it to be that rose colored. Um, you mean frozen berry metallic? Yes. You know, I you, do. You just come up with that right now. No, it's my favorite color. Do you know that I, I, an article I, I bought a Boxster on that in that color. Did you? Really? Yeah, yeah. It's it's coming like real soon. Really? Yeah. Porsche just needs I to give you one. I have a frozen berry metallic coffee mug sitting on my desk right now. <sighs> it's the best color ever. Yeah. Yes. 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 I love that I car. Knew I you love were that a car. woman of taste. Why? Thank you. Frozen berry metallic is that the is, jam. It is gorgeous. It is the. Just. There it is. Yes. Yeah. It's the best. Yeah, I wrote an article in Forbes about it. Did you? Be- because. <sighs> Because they're not marketing certain vehicles to certain communities. And I went what to... What community is underserved in the Frozen Berry Metallic marketing plan? So, we can call people at Porsche and fix this. So I am a member of the illustrious Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And we do... There, I'm see, that's be right a picture. With this. And that's a photo of me. <laughs> My husband and I are not staying oh, next to your, the, Oh, there's yeah, your article. In one heck forms. of a ride. Um, All right, bookmark this, Zach, so, so I can relay. So, it, you know, when <laughs> I went to Carson and I did the the the, the test ride, yeah, um, it was all couples. Everybody, every wife had gotten it for their husband and me, yes. and people were like, "You're letting her." And my Oof. husband was like, <laughs> the, uh, "This what, this is her thing. This yeah. what she, this is what she does." You're letting her drive. Oh, right. how adorable! Well, that's, a, that's a great car, and that but, is a great color. And we need to make sure that Porsche markets it to the correct group of people. To the correct group. Of, it's a beautiful Sorority line. girls, line them up. Line them up. <laughs> because we, we're more active as, as adults because yeah. it's just the way our organization. Everyone knows the sorority girls really have the good credit scores and shit, too. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that rules. Oh, but that cool. I'm glad gorgeous. we're on the same team. Yeah. I, uh, I have a couple of thoughts on current events in cars that I want to run by your brain. Okay. Do you mind? Sure. Today in the LA Times, they announced that California would be adopting the widespread use of digital license plates. Did you see this one? I did not read the full article, but I know about the digital license plate move. Apparently, there's a couple of, quote, advantages, according to the state. Mm. One is that you will be able to 
not just pay your registration annually, but be able to pay monthly, which also means Whoa. the other side of that means they can turn off your goddamn license plate if you don't pay them, yeah. which is crazy. But also, if your car gets stolen, your plate will display stolen I on mean, it. That's pretty which cool. Which is kind of cool. There's also the surveillance capitalism angle that there, it's a trackable thing that's going to be. Uh, your car's you trackable be, anyway. Of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. But but the, now your license plate's trackable yes. too. Uh, what are your thoughts on a digital pay as you go license plate? Well, you know, my perspective is probably a little different than most. I was the chief operating officer in New Jersey. This is when, why I'm asking you this question. When we were making changes to to the license plate and adopting what we called our sports plates packages for for people who were sports. pathetically fans of maybe the Jets or something like that. Anyway, I'm a Cowboys fan. No, I I, <laughs> I was wondering if you meant literal sports plates or if there was something else I need to literal, know about the license literal plate. Literal sports okay. plates. Okay. Um. It's very complicated and technical and incredibly, incredibly, incredibly expensive. The digital plates. Because what happens is you have legacy systems and everything ties into one another. Yeah, the DMVs are not the model of efficiency. So in order to move to the digital space, mm -hmm. every piece of that motor vehicle would have to be able to tie in. Um, the car is stolen, that's what it's gonna display, and you don't think that before you put that on the roadway, people who wanna steal cars, they're not gonna figure out a way Oh, they read the to, LA Times right. too. <laughs> they're, they're By the way, I do have to say, this seems so far, it seems like an opt-in system, and it's expensive. The, the digital plate is like $300, like right. it's expensive. Right. The irony of having a pay-as-you-go registration mm. mated with a very expensive really digital strange. plate right. is a little silly. And of me. course, there's that recurring fee that you'll pay yes. to make that monthly payment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, we're making the, the the car something that you for people who want to drive. You're not going to want to drive. Yeah. We we keep adding things on that. That's not making the user experience better. Just makes it more like your phone or your Apple and, TV. And and again. Who made a policy or even thought of something like that? You're, you work for motor vehicles in California, and you're like, what is the state missing? <laughs> what can I do to make this more complicated? Hmm. <laughs> we should do this really expensive technology upgrade so that we can accommodate digital plates that cost a lot of money so rich people's cars don't get stolen. I like. I'm just. I'm, it sounds like tech for tech's sake. Because mm -hmm. you can read license plates yeah. now. You don't need that to read a license plate. Right. And right. license plates are very reliable right now. And and a lot of times, uh, in our prison systems, license license plates are still being made in some form or fashion with some connection to to prison labor. It's putting money in people's commissary accounts. Yeah. So I take it that's a no from you. Okay. Right now, right now, it's not high on the problems okay. we have to be solved. Yeah. So, uh, question two: My, f me, and some of my friends have always did, does, had had sort of a why don't they just theory about a tiered licensing system, whereby if you have a certain amount of extra high performance training mm -hmm. and you have a car is a high performance vehicle subject to a higher, more rigorous level of inspection that maybe you should be allowed to drive a little faster. Ooh. What do you think about a system like that? Is that, and I'm looking for you to shoot, I'm looking for you to go, Matt, that's stupid and here's why. I'm not actually looking for you to endorse this. I'm just curious because you've been on both sides of this. Yeah, I'm thinking about it literally based on being on the Autobahn a few weeks ago in Germany. Same thing. They have they have a a, a, lice, a, a, a variable speed limiting system right. connected to cars, dependent on conditions. They have excellent road maintenance, mm -hmm. excellent training. Correct. And it seems to work pretty good over there. And you just gave all the reasons why it won't work. <laughs> 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 dumb drivers and dumb cars. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. yeah. It's, Point it's, taken. Our, our infrastructure is horrible. Yeah. 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 The part yeah. of the 405 that has a yump in it, I mean, hit that at Ooh, 90, it's, good. it's scary. It's, yeah. The solid axle test <laughs> is a good one. No, yeah, I, 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 you're, you're totally right. 
But God, a man can dream, can't I? It would be wonderful, right? right. You just like let it go. Some I've cars were made to go schools. fast. I'm driving a McLaren up the road. Plus, I mean, imagine I could. Uh, I could show off that I had a cool thing like a license plate that said I could go 100 without having to add more crap on my car. That would be sweet. Wow. Except everybody's going to go 100 anyway. I know. And, you know, operational authority. Wyoming may let you go 100 on their roadways. Mm -hmm. South Dakota might say go 100 on their roadways. There's In nothing Nevada, to stop them. In Nevada, they do. It's informal, but they do. <laughs> <laughs> they do it by making the roads dead straight and boring. Yeah. The turnpike, it's 85, but, you know. You're Welcome to Nevada. To have at it. Right. Is the, yeah. They have operational authority, but, you know, back to who's going who's gonna to get that option, and the kid who's 21 or 19 is going to be doing it anyway. Oh, I've seen it on Instagram. Yeah. I know. It is not good. Um, okay. What, in your experience with DOT and all this other stuff, what actually re real world reduces traffic? What do you think, if we want to reduce traffic, what, g and give me a top level summary of what you think we could do to reduce traffic. Get people out of their cars. Mm. Um, it's hard. It really is. The way we have built our entire society means I have to think about me and my needs and not holistically. So if I go to work and I'm taking the train to commute, but I got a kid at daycare and I have to get to daycare at a certain time and I, maybe the only way to reliably do that is to be in my own car. But if I had daycare in the building, then I could take public transportation to and from, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't be as concerned with that. So sometimes the solution isn't even necessarily a transportation-based solution. Absolutely. It's a whole society solution that puts your other needs first that, that don't necessarily force you out of your car. It just eliminates that extra side trip that is accessible, you know, that would, it would only be accessible by car. Right. So if you you can extrapolate that to healthcare, mm -hmm. you know, visiting nurses rather than you going and sitting in a long waiting room for maintenance care. Mm -hmm. If you look at the pandemic, when you know mostly white collar workers, people who are office workers, could sit at home and work from their laptop and get the business of their company done, they could do it, and we saw a significant reduction on our roadways now. Fatalities and crashes increased, and I think we need to address those issues. Weren't people driving wasted? Way too yeah, just, wasted just, just, and yeah, crazy yeah, fast. Yeah. But yeah. but we certainly reduced congestion on the mm -hmm. roadway. Now, I think people need to be in spaces where they congregate together. I think it makes for a more meaningful outcome, better results. So you got to go back to the office. I mean, if you don't have to, and there are other ways for you to commune, bully on you. But I do think that people should be in communal Certain spaces. Certain industries, yeah. Others, other industries maybe not doesn't so, matter not, so not much. Not so much. But, but yeah. if you can reduce, if we, if we start to say, you don't have to go to work five days a week in the right, office right. and start to pull some of that out of our system, and we have to find better ways to incentivize public transportation. I've taken photos inside buses, inside trains. Ugh. They're dirty, they're smelly, and they're unsafe. If you look at bus stops that we want our, you know, to send your young people to go stand at in the morning, some kids would rather not go to school than stand yeah. at that bus stop for their safety. We need to really look at all those other things that are tangential to our transportation. And if we can start to solve for those things, we start to make it possible to address some of these bigger issues. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's really simple. I think Alyssa Walker had a tweet thing uh, a couple weeks ago about bus stops in Los Angeles and how few of them have shade of yeah. any kind. Yeah, and so it's shelters, like yeah. kind of can be dangerous in July to stand out there and wait for a bus. Because the person who signed that procurement slip doesn't stand on a bus stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. One thing I, I hear you not saying is that we need to invent whole new technologies to solve this. I, I think what we miss in the technology game is the social sciences. Mm -hmm. we, we have to be in partnership with each other. It can't be. The creator, the inventor, is who goes to Washington, D.C. and says, I came up with this newfangled thing, and I'm going to solve the world with it. 
but they're not a social scientist and they really haven't taken all the steps to figure out how it impacts and who it impacts. When I talk to people, and you know, I'm an AV person as well as an EV person, but I talk to people who say, AVs are great. People are gonna just get in their AVs and go to work and they can work the minute they get in their car. Well, maybe I don't want to work the minute I, I get in my, in my car. car. Yeah. And people who have to work the minute they get in their car have chauffeurs. They're good. We're, they're not thinking about people just moving in society, getting their daily work done, because they're not solving a problem. They've come up with a technology, right, right. but they're not solving a problem. Somebody should be looking at problem solving, and not just with these cute today terms that I'm, you know, I'm worried about equity when you don't even know what equity means and really look at society. Do we have streets that are properly striped so that kids can walk across the street when they're going to school? Can I walk down my sidewalk or are the trees and the roots pushed up so much yeah. that the person in a wheelchair has to come out onto the main road mm -hmm. in order to in order to move from one space to another? So I, they, they can take a drone taxi that will fly <laughs> them from one side of the sidewalk to so the other. I, was, I lived on a street and I just moved, so I don't live there anymore, but I lived on a street in Venice. It was a one-way street. One way, one lane. But it was very poorly signed. And people would fly the wrong way down the street. And I'm talking 30, 40 miles an hour the wrong way on the street. Now, the street is wide enough for two cars to pass, you know, barely. Yeah, but it's but a one way. But it's a <laughs> one way. And people would also walk and bike, and there's no sidewalks, it's just street and garages. Mm. Till one day, they put painted lines, and they made it a one car width, right. with big fucking arrows, Going, and all of a sudden, and I'm talking overnight, people with slow down. paint, 97% mm -hmm. of people going the wrong way down the street stopped instantly with paint. And urban planners can tell you community <laughs> you know, after like, community. They do that in Europe. Yeah. They found that when you, when you do things like make a road narrower, yeah, yeah. you make it safer. Yeah. We want these big, wide roadways here because we know that if it's narrow, we gotta slow down. Yeah. We don't need to invent technology for that. It's just, we need to- uh, we, we have some solutions <laughs> already ex yeah, existing. Yeah. We just need to have the cojones. Totally. To, to stop you, um, to start using them. Zach, do we have anything for Salika on the Patreon? Mm -hmm. Of course, if you wanna ask questions of our guests, patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast is where to do that. Uh, we are only going to do questions directly for Salika today. And uh, what do we got? Prashan says, uh, do you think some autonomous driving functions can be implemented as plug-in embedded systems or are they so woven into larger systems they need to design from the get-go? Could those systems be ported from one vehicle to another? An add-on AV system is what he's asking about. Listen, there's some people out there that think that that will be a possibility, but from a technology standpoint, you think Ford and GM want to make it so that some other out there manufacturer yeah. can plug in and play something from one vehicle to another? It just from for their own technology, they're not, they're not going yeah. to. They're, they're Nobody not wants do. to open source their cars. No. That, I don't no. see that really happening. Yeah. Chris Navio says, "Why doesn't the U.S. invest in high-speed rail like Europe and Japan?" Because a long time ago, the United States made the decision that their investment was gonna be in the roadway. And, and that investment is that, that turn and that divide. Listen, we had subway systems long before other countries had it, and it seemed like a really cool thing at the time, but we also have something that's older, and we haven't kept up. And state by state, when the dollars are coming in, we've diverted it to other uses rather than using it what it's supposed to be before, which is making our our roadways and our transportation systems better and up to date. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'm gonna combine Thomas and Nathan's questions because they're kind of the same. Uh, Salika, do you believe we will see robust federal autonomous vehicle laws and regulations or are they destined to remain at the state? And also, can you comment on whether terms like full self-driving <laughs> and autopilot will be subject to federal regulation? I think in my lifetime, maybe I'll live really old, um, we will eventually see AV laws. I think the I think the industry is kind of full of it. They sort of want the laws so they can have the ability to move from one state to another seamlessly. 
but they don't really want the laws because then they can't just innovate and play around out there and see what does and doesn't work. And, and right now they can lean on there not being a law a little bit. It's Correct. kind of convenient for them to it not be It is very, laws. very convenient for them. But but that second question gets my ire all the time. I In every space I am, there's no such thing as full self-drive. There's no such thing as full self-drive. You can't buy it anywhere in the United States, yeah. anywhere in the world. You can't buy it. And There the, was a great talk in Germany on the term autonomous washing, which I thought, I, God, I wish she went harder into the paint. I know why she didn't. She could have. Right. I know why she didn't, but uh, yeah. She... I've been quoted uh, several times by saying, um, I think we owe Tesla a debt of gratitude for the widespread use of electric vehicles. The United, I blame our federal government for not standing up and saying, what you're doing is against FTC regulation, and if you don't cut it out, we're not going to let you operate in the United States, and then they'd stop doing that crap. Fair. Yeah. I think I think it's fair. I, I to me, I'm not a lawyer, but to me, it's deeply deceptive, and it and not only is it deeply deceptive, it's working. Like it is, <laughs> it is working. It's working, and not only on the individual level. People that call themselves reporters are it's crazy. Well, it's the cult of personality on top yeah. of um, just it's untrue. Yeah, you know, false. Yeah. Uh, I think we already talked about mm -hmm. Jake's question. Yeah. We'll come back to that. No, we won't. We won't come back to it. Sorry, Jake. We already covered there. Uh, Salika, thoughts, uh, Strom Speed, thoughts and takeaways on the recent Business Week article bashing AB, AV progress. I didn't see this article. Did you? So Self-driving cars right. are going nowhere by Math, Max Chafe, Chafkin. Well, listen, if you were Anthony and it didn't go so well for you, what would you be saying, right? When I started having a greater understanding about AVs was 2010. And back then, the industry was saying, it's coming. Just give it a couple of years, it'll be here. They were very confident for a minute, weren't well, they? Well, and 12 years later, yeah, we have spent a lot of money, and we're not there yet. But we have made strides. Um, I think part of the problem is where we're making strides. Chandler, Arizona might have been cute for a month or two to test, but who the hell in Chandler, Arizona <laughs> needs the AV? <laughs> You should have been, I, I think, L.A. should be a test bed for the use of AVs, but in communities that have transportation deserts. Sure. And connect them to public transportation. I'm not taking you to, you know, your girlfriend's house. Connect you to public transportation and see how that un untested geofenced corridors. And that's what we should be doing around the country. You could do that now. And LA is not that hard. You, LA's got pretty pretty straight roads, pretty well marked. The weather's pretty good. It's you not could do it that now. hard. Right. But the, it's but, not Boston. But you know what? Then that means I'm not selling a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar A V to an individual. That's I see that's And where, that's the problem. Yeah. And I said it in Germany and I'll say it again. There are not enough rich people to buy AVs. Yeah. So you gotta find another use for them. Yeah. And I think that public transportation piece is best. Sure. One more before we are out of here. Zach, I need to see the question, oh, please. Sorry. He's all distracted <laughs> over there. I'm responding to the people. He's trying hard. Zach literally came, was here 20 minutes before he got off a flight from Italy. Yeah. Wow. So Zach gets 100 points for the day. Absolutely. <laughs> you walked in the door, put down a suitcase, chugged a coffee, and then is doing this show. I am so. impressed. Yeah. Uh, Rich B, uh, I moved from New York City to a rural area in New York. I understand AVs in a dense urban environment, but to me they make more sense in a rural area as everything is so spread out. Is anyone working on AV for deliveries in rural areas? So Is that that difficult? I mean, why, why do we need to eliminate that human doing deliveries in rural areas? So what he said is part of the reason why we can't get legislation is because... Those who are um, who represent districts that are rural, rural or suburban are like, well, that city is getting all this AV stuff, and it's not for my community, so I'm not going to help them. Mm. But AVs can be effective in almost any space. One of the reasons it makes sense in a large urban environment is instead of sending the car in to do your pizza, and I can stick it in the robot delivery and send it across town. Then I, I'm not, it's not only the environmental issues, it's the congestion. Mm -hmm. But rural people have the same issues when it comes to availability. I live 30 miles out and we only have one vehicle on the farm and it's being used to service the farm. How do I get goods and services? So 
if there are ways to deliver goods to you that are autonomous, go for it. I don't think one negates the other. Mm. And there are people that are looking at, at both. People are looking at EVs on farms. I know that makes a lot of sense. But for farming equipment, what do you do? I mean, I don't know. They drive, a lot of times they'll drive the same predictable route over and over. Right, if you could guarantee that, you know, I'm I'm within the mileage range, I'm gonna be fine each day. That's why I think like short range delivery, beer trucks, mail trucks, UP, like all that that short miles, long idling, all that shit should be electric. Which I think that to me, that's uh, an argument why it's better or why it's being developed in urban environments first is because one, the delivery systems will be used more frequently because of population density, right? But then also, I mean, if you're in like the rural like parts of Malibu or, San, or California mountains, like driveways get really wonky and there's the roads are less marked. Like it, it would be a lot more challenging, I think, at this point for an autonomous vehicle to navigate an evening delivery for UPS like mm-hmm. out in the sticks just because of road markers and clarity. But one of the things is a project that's going on right now. I think it's Copia Global in Kenya where they've sort of reinvented the general store so that people in a, in a spread out rural community order their stuff and it goes to that general store. And then they go mm-hmm. in on a Saturday like it was, you know, the Waltons or something and they pick up their goods mm-hmm. that have been delivered there. It doesn't mean that the delivery has to be up that winding road yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. to, you know, to your, um, you know, your wood house. Yeah. It just means that we're putting goods and making the services available in places that typically wouldn't have it. And if I have to deliver to your house personally, it becomes much more difficult to cover all that territory instead of going to yeah. like the general store. This is gonna sound very hoity-toity, but my folks have a place in South Carolina and it's on this island and th- deliveries don't go to your house. They go to the main right. building, no matter what it is. Right. And it's not that bad. You drive a few miles to the main building, you pick up your stuff a couple times a week. It's a pretty good system, actually. And you talk to the people it's a, in your community. It is a pretty good system. But it's you could have drone delivery. It's not bad. You could get your coffee you know, to your... T- I, <laughs> I, I thought that guy was interesting, and, I would, mm. I, and, Bo, and JF and I really would like to... Next time we're in that part of the world, make a trip to Dublin and see that thing in action. Yeah. I have my doubts, but he was an awful good salesman. <laughs> he, he was, listen, he was a, a hot real, coffee in my hands in two minutes. Yeah. I'm, I'm, that's, that's awesome. I don't want it in my life, but as a, it was a novelty that I, that I, I, I saw the humor in for a few it's, minutes. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I cannot thank you enough for your time. I know how busy you are teaching and all the things you do. It's such an interesting conversation, and I really appreciate you coming in and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you both for having me, I appreciate where, uh, it. Where can people find you if they wanna follow you on, do you do social media? Or I you... do social media, LinkedIn and Twitter is usually where, where people reach me. Um, I have my Salika Josiah Talbot and people can email me there as well. Um, we'll so, put your social media in the description of the uh, of the episode so we can find it. And yeah, I'm happy to impact the conversation. Thank you, Salika. Yeah, you're, you're awesome and let's talk about how we can get more people to buy Frozen Berry Metallic, uh, <laughs> Tycons, <laughs> yes. and how we can find um, some black and brown women to talk about cars. Love that. I'm, not, I'm probably the wrong person to help, but if I can, I will. We can figure it out. I can find the right person somewhere. Right. All right, thanks. It. That's our show. I will see you guys next time. <laughs>